Okay. Hi, who are you? <laughs> I'm Malcolm Walter. I'm an astrobiologist at the University of New South Wales. And are we alone? Well, that's the... That's the well, I'm going to rock, aren't I? That's the question, isn't it, Charlie? And nobody knows the answer. Nobody knows the answer. Nobody so knows the answer. So, okay, so why are we even talking about it? Because it's one of the biggest questions in uh, humanity. Well, why? What makes it big? Well, why we, is it important? We only have one sample of life, and that's, uh, that's life on Earth. Everything we know about biology is based on one sample. How do you know it's one sample? Because uh, it shares the same genetics. Same genetics? You mean DNA code? Yes, I mean, uh, yes, I told you about that. I should have okay. shut that door. Right, I got it. You mean DNA code? Yeah, I mean the DNA code and, and a lot of the biochemical machinery as well. So what is like the most profound biochemical machinery you can think of? Oh, protein synthesis. Protein synthesis, so ribosomes. Mm. Yeah. So viruses come from another source since they don't do the protein synthesis. Uh, then... Well, viruses don't necessarily come from another source. Maybe they, they come from the closer to the origin of life, which is one hypothesis. Do you subscribe to that hypothesis? I think it's a, it's a reasonable hypothesis. It's difficult to prove or disprove, but uh, it makes sense and, uh, in the sense that they're much simpler than uh, cellular organisms. Uh, and one can imagine that they're, they're a step on the way to cells. Okay, and so let me ask you again, are we alone? Are we alone? Not as far as I know. Not as far as you know, okay. <laughs> okay. And what is the evidence that we have, one way or the other, on this issue? Well, we don't really have any significant evidence. There, there are some interesting hints from Mars. I think that's as close as we get at the moment. So what are those hints? The, the, the hints are um, methane in the atmosphere of Mars. So you're saying that that might be biogenic? Well, there are two, two main sources of methane on, on Earth. One is biogenic from methanogenic bacteria, and the other is from volcanic systems. So how do they compare? Which is, which is more powerful on Earth? A factor of a thousand more from, from life? That's a good question, Charlie, and I don't know a quantitative answer. Okay. Um, so again, what is the evidence that, I mean, if we have a course called Are We Alone, presumably it's about something, and that something has to be evidence that, at least indirect, some kind of indirect evidence. So not, if we don't have direct evidence, what is the indirect evidence to what, try to answer this question? Uh, the indirect evidence is that we know there are uh, planetary systems probably uh, around most stars now, and there are going to be a lot of Earth-like planets in the, in the universe. Uh, including planets in just the Goldilocks zone where there can be liquid water, which seems to be absolutely essential for life, as we know life anyway. Am I rocking? Yeah, yeah, you are. Okay, so, so again, why is this question important? I'm trying to, because you're a student, you're 20 years old, you can go out and play soccer, you can get drunk, you're looking for a woman, or the women's looking for men. I mean, why should you care about whether you're alone or not? I think it's a big philosophical question and it has all sorts of implications. It has um, religious implications, for example. So uh, for you, what are those religious implications? Well, they're, they're not terribly important for me because I'm an atheist. Okay. Uh, uh, so for an atheist, what does the, the question, are we alone, does that represent a way in which you're searching to fit into the universe without, in a non-supernatural way? Uh, no, it's not so much how I, uh, we uh, fit into the universe. It, it's a question of whether life on Earth is the only form of life there is. And uh, uh, I think if we, if we had a, only one more sample of life, we could start to generalise about how life arose, for example. We don't know how life started. We're perhaps creep, creeping towards an answer, but uh, still a long way from an answer. So uh, we don't know how life started. We can't really make predictions about, um, therefore, about uh, how common life might be in the universe. If you, don't, if you don't know the steps along the way, how can you make a quantitative prediction? I think that's a big issue. So if we found even one other sample of life and we could demonstrate that it was different from life on Earth, where we'd be a, a long way, well, Mm-hmm. <laughs>
<coughs> all right. Don't worry, I'm good at editing. Mm. <laughs> That's good. But the situation at present is that we can't make quantitative predictions about the likelihood of there being life elsewhere because we only have the life on Earth as our sole example of life. But that doesn't and stop. And we don't, we don't know how it started, and therefore we can't make predictions about the likelihood of it starting somewhere else. So when people fill out numbers in the Drake equation, that's just frou-frou, frou-frou? Oh, the Drake equation is a, is a good, valid attempt to try and quantify the, the possibility of life elsewhere. But it's missing that, that key element, the, how life started and what the probability of the, uh, life starting anywhere else might be. We simply don't know. Well, life starting is one factor in the Drake equation, but there's also about intelligent life. Once you get life started, how often will it become intelligent? And then how often will it make radio telescopes and, and communicate? And then how, how long will it stay alive? These are all very hard to answer. And I guess because you're not a sociologist, that you're very reluctant to put answers, put numbers to these factors. Yeah, well, we can put some good numbers to some of those Drake factors now, can't we? we the astronomical with, ones, yes. With the astronomical factors, we know a lot more than Drake did when he first um, put together that so-called formula. Okay, have you ever seen a UFO? <laughs> no, I have never seen a UFO. Really? You've never seen an unidentified flying object? No, I've never seen an unidentified flying object. Because uh, no. everything you've seen in the sky, you've identified. I couldn't put the names to all the birds, but yes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> all right. And uh, have you ever been abducted by aliens? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Have you ever met somebody who was abducted by aliens or said they were abducted by aliens? Uh, no, I haven't actually. No. But you've met somebody who said, oh, I saw a UFO, I bet. I, yes, I have. But I, I dismiss them. So how do you d dismiss them politely? I mean, as a scientist, if somebody says, oh, I saw a UFO and it's an alien civilization from Portugal or something, and what do you do in that case? Many of scientists are in this situation where we have a very enthusiastic person who is tired of hearing scientists poo-poo them, and how do you non-poo-poo them? Well, if they're true believers, I don't bother to poo-poo them at all. I mean, it's like uh, arguing about um, whether evolution is, is valid. So, so let's say that I'm, I believe in UFOs and I have UFO land in my backyard and you, you're a scientist, you say, well, show me the evidence. So what evidence could I give to you that would convince you that indeed an alien civilization created a spaceship, landed in my backyard and then left something? What would you need, what would be proof for you of that or at least evidence for that? Uh, I would like one of the creatures that landed the UFO and I'd like to check his or her uh, physical characteristics genetic molecules, for example. How about the isotopic abundances of the metal that's being, that was put together on an alien planet? Wouldn't that be very different than any metal we could put together here? Uh, no, I don't think so. Okay. All right. Uh -huh. And tell us a little bit more. Now, your, one of your specialties is early life on Earth. It is. Stromatolites, for example. Can mm -hmm. you tell us what stromatolites are? They're um, microbial reefs. They're, they're structures that can be as big as the Great Barrier Reef, but built by microbes. And they're generally layered because they, they form millimetre by millimetre layers as a accrete. Yeah, uh, you have something over here. Is this a stromatolite there? <laughs> this is a somewhat adulterated stromatolite Can with a bottle put... of wine in the, in the middle. Oh, all right. Can you show us that? All right. <laughs> there it is. Okay. So this is a... 2.7 billion year old stromatolite. 2.7, how do you know how old it is? Well, it's been dated, it comes from rocks in the Pilbara in Western Australia and uh, interlayered with, with this limestone layer, there are volcanic rocks that contain radioisotopes. Where, I mean, this is a limestone layer you're saying? Yeah. Could you point to some of the layers, please? You can see the, the, the mic almost microscopic layers there, each one uh, representing a former Microbial mat, we call it. Micro now, it's not doesn't look very flat. It looks like it's cone shaped. Yeah, these these are distinctive sorts of stromatolites that um, 
We can reason we're formed by photosynthetic organisms. Photosynthetic organisms. Mm. How long ago? You said 2.7 billion? 2.7 billion years ago. And then on the right-hand side, I see some another one that's coming up. It looks like some kind of tower. Yeah, yeah. Well, there are three of them. Three yeah. of them, okay. Mm. And, two, and all of them are 2.7. Each one of those layers, how long is that, did that layer live? For a thousand years, a hundred years, or ten years, or ten uh, minutes? Or <laughs> We don't know for sure uh, with these ancient examples, but... For modern examples, um, each lemma might represent a day, a uh, day. Or, or, or a season or, so, so or a storm. So altogether, how much time are we looking at? We're looking at a few hundred years. A few years hundred years, top yeah. to bottom. Mm. A few hundred years, all right. And is that our ancestor? Did that evolve into us? Well, it's part of our uh, ancestry. and it's. I mean, could that organism that was there have evolved into you and me? Is my question. Not whether it's a sister group, but could that organism have been, if you had your ancestor and your ancestor and your ancestors, could that be one of them? Uh, this could be one of them, in the sense that there could be one component um, that eventually became a nucleated cell. Mm -hmm. The organisms that built these stromatolites were not nucleated. The DNA was scattered through the cell material, the mm -hmm. cytoplasm. Mm -hmm. And so there had to have been a series of steps to get from bacteria, like the things that built this, through to sexually reproducing cells, right. and then on to animals. Right, but, but that could be your great-great-great-great-great-great-grandmother and father or something. Yeah, could be. Okay, very good. So 2.7 billion years ago, look at that. Mm -hmm. All right, and uh, so why is it important to know about stromatolite? How old do stromatolites get? What are the oldest ones? The oldest known stromatolites uh, come from the same area as this particular specimen. They're 3.49 billion years old. 3.49? Mm. Okay, and uh, do you think there are stromatolites older than that? I mean, or is just, is, in other words, you're not finding the absolute oldest ones that were ever on Earth, you're finding some... The oldest preserved ones. Preserved ones. And now, the, the problem... Go ahead. <laughs> The problem we have there is that the further we go back in time, the fewer and fewer rocks we have to examine right. to look for evidence of life. And can you make a, a, a semi-educated guess about when the first stromatolites were? No, I don't think anybody can make that, that, that guess. I mean, uh, there are a tantrum... We'll start again. There are possible stromatolites in old rocks in Greenland but they're very tentative and uh, not convincing. And those rocks are, are nearly four billion years old. When somebody asks me how long has life been on this planet, I say, oh, about four billion years. What do you say? Well, I don't, I don't say four billion years. And the reason why you, you say four billion probably is because of the, uh, uh, what's called the late heavy bombardment, uh, which is postulated uh, to have occurred about um, 3.9 to 4.1 billion years ago, based on evidence from the moon, which is now r rather equivocal, I think. So what I say is that life could have started 4.5 uh, 4 billion years ago, quite easily, and uh, could have persisted um, right up until the age of the stromatolite. So 4.5, so okay. After the moon had formed. After the moon had formed. Well, mm. that's about 4.5, right? Yeah. Okay, so the reason I say 4 is not because of the late heavy bombardment. I, too, am a late heavy bombardment skeptic. Mm. The reason I say 4 is because, well, the earliest evidence we have here is like 3.5 or 3.8 or 3.9. And then I say, well, it's a very sparse record, so let's add a little bit and, and add 100 or 200 million years and call it 4 billion just because it's a round number not because I particularly like that or I particularly think that the light heavy bombardment is a barrier. Yeah, well, I don't like that because it leads to the conclusion for some people, I'm not saying for you, but for some people, that life started as soon as it could. Mm -hmm. So it's already a probabilistic statement, which is invalid in, in my view, because if you, if you don't think the late heavy bombardment was a sterilising event on Earth, mm -hmm then the only constraint is the moon-forming event at 4.5 billion years ago. I just don't want pe people to, to jump to the conclusion that life started as soon as it could, mm -hmm. and therefore it must be a relatively easy mm -hmm. 
um, chemical biological process, and therefore it's uh, very likely to have occurred in other places. So you're saying... I don't like the chain of logic. You don't like the chain of logic. Mm. If we could say that life started as soon as it could, then you would accept that logic. If we could say that, yes, I, I'd be inclined to accept that logic. So have you argued with Carl Sagan about this? Because he, I think, is the origin of this statement. Oh, it's, it started as soon as it could, therefore it's likely to be elsewhere. I think he's the origin of that hand-waving statement, I think. Is that right? Yes, I think you're probably right. I'm, uh, I have wondered about who, who first said it, but it sounds like a Sagan statement. Okay, so you've <laughs> never talked to him about this? No. Have you met Carl Sagan? Yeah, I met him once years ago. You, and did, what did you talk about? Uh, From Adelaide? Or? <laughs> no, it was in a group situation where it wasn't a one-on-one -on -one, one -on -one conversation. Okay. Mm. So what do you think of him in general? He's been a, the inspiration for many of us to study astrobiology or exobiology. Yeah. And it, was he an inspiration for you? Uh, I wouldn't call him an inspiration. He's very, uh, he was a very eloquent and imaginative and thoughtful interesting scientist, uh, but um, uh, not, not specifically an inspiration for me. All right. Now, um, let me put this down. <laughs> sure, yeah, put that down. Um, now, sometimes, some people study early life by looking at genes and, and making a genetic tree of life, a phylogenetic yeah. tree, but you're more of a fossil person, right? I am. I'm a fossil person. Tell us about this connection between genes and fossils. Are they mutually, are they complementary? Or I know that sometimes they're, they fight with each other. So no, no, that's way off. Or, uh, tell me about the dating problem, geochronology, or the dating of early life based on fossils versus based on genes. Well, we can directly date fossils. Um, and um, so that m makes them particularly valuable. And we can say uh, a lot, even about microbial fossils, we can make some reasonable deductions about what sort of microbes they, they were, for example, and what their ages are. So that, that's, uh, from a geological point of view, what fossils offer. Genes uh, allow us to look at the the family relationships of all current life on Earth. But if you try to make a, a time prediction from um, the genes of current life, mm -hmm. you have to calibrate it against something because r rates of evolution change mm -hmm. uh, between types of organisms and, and with time. And so ultimately, uh, you have to calibrate the genetic record against the geological record. And we run, run into the same old problem that the further we go back in time the, in the geological record, the less evidence we have. But, but when you say you date something with a fossil, so you have a, sure, that's fine to have a date, but often those dates are used as the first evidence of that particular thing. And if your fossil record is sparse, which it inevitably is, then you are using the wrong date as the first evidence, right? It's an, fossil evidence is an at least date, yep. not the date. That's and correct. If, and the phylogenetic genetic evidence is an estimate of the date of the divergence. Yes. So that seems to be an advantage. Uh, but still, ultimately, it depends on the geological record. And it has to be it, consistent with it. Well, it's more than consistency. If you want an absolute date, uh, where do you get it from genetics? But what I'm saying is you don't get an absolute date from the fossil record. You get it, this thing has, gives you an at least this old or yes. older. Yes. For example, if I could go out there and find a, a stromatolite, I could say, oh, the stromatolites are 10 years old. And that would be a stupid thing because that would be the oldest one that I've found. And to say that that's then useful is kind of silly. And then but the, the gene guy, people say, oh, no, it's 4 billion years old. And they're much closer because they have all this. Well, anyway, you know what I'm saying. Yeah, but if you're talking about... Um the last 500 million years of, of the geological record, for example, is such a dense record that the first evidence of a particular group is likely to be very close to the right. Uh, but we're hardly ever in astrobiology. We're hardly ever talking about the most recent 500 million years. No. So as I said before, further we go back in time, the the um, uh, more patchy the evidence is. And uh, uh, so, of course, we're not look, talking about the you know, origination of groups. We're talking about a minimum age. Okay. And um, how about RNA world versus or RNA versus DNA? I've heard and I've read 
that RNA preceded DNA. Do you know what the evidence for that is? Uh, it's, a, it's a simpler molecule. A uh, simpler sing, molecule. Sing, single strand rather than the, the double strand like, like DNA. Uh, and it's, uh, well, like v viruses, for example. Often... Well, viruses have DNA and RNA. There are DNA viruses and RNA viruses. Yeah, I know, right? yes. So, But if you're, you're looking for some simpler and simpler things back in time than, than uh, um, an RNA virus um, fits the bill as a, All right. it's a symbol organism. Okay. Now, uh, so you used the word life so far several times in this interview. And uh, I'm, wait, let me, I'm rearranging this a little bit so I get a little bit higher. Sorry. So you've used the word life several times in this interview and as if it meant something. So could you tell me what you have meant when you use the word life? I mean uh, an information storage and uh, transmission system. So like a virus? Like a virus. So you're, you believe that viruses are alive then? I would consider them to be alive, yes. How about, I've got a book here. This is a book and printing is an information storage and retrieval system. Is that alive? No. Okay, why not? Because it can't reproduce itself. Well, I can't reproduce myself, neither can one cat. Two cats could reproduce <laughs> themselves, but one cannot. But you would say that cat is alive, right? Yes. So, so my dog out there, uh, Dilly, cannot reproduce herself. So neither can this book, but you want to call Dilly alive and this book not. So how does that work? Uh, well, life also processes energy in simple molecules. So there's a set of characteristics. The informational system, and, and uh, there is the living part of the system, the, the uh, uh, biochemistry of the cells that, that, that takes in energy of the sun, for example, or chemical energy. But you just said viruses were alive. They do the information part, but they don't do this energy part that you're now adding. Yes. So I'm, I'm confused. So am I. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. All right. No, I'm, th I'm thinking about a, a process that goes from chemicals that nobody would, would call living through a series of steps to cells that everybody would agree as living. And somewhere along the way, it's a fuzzy zone where you can choose to call viruses alive or you can choose to uh, think they're not all alive, but they're in that chain that ultimately leads, we think, to uh, life that we would all agree about. So Your dog, my cat, whatever. So if we, I mean, we, as scientists, we have this view of, okay, there's an a abiotic world, and then somehow it evolves, molecular evolution evolves, and then turns into something maybe like viruses, and then that evolves into life somehow, and then we can have a cell wall and all the other things. Yeah. Now, it seems to me that in, if that's the, our model, then it doesn't make sense to define life in any way because the earlier you go back, whatever you've defined will get thrown away and deconstructed because that you have to get arrive at something that's not alive. Yeah. And so the process of deconstructing is something I'm interested in rather than black and white, alive or not alive. Mm. Any comments on that? Uh, well, the, the problem of defining life has been a problem for everybody who's tried to do it. Uh, uh, forever. So it, it's not very useful uh, to even uh, try to define life, uh, I think, in a, in a sense. But if you think about the total evolutionary process, you know, somewhere along the, the way you, you have to say you've got something living. So, so we're dealing Do you with, really have we, to say that? Well... Because, for example, maybe in a billion years, whatever we evolve into, mm -hmm. they will not recognize us as something living because they'll define life based on whatever it is that we have evolved into. So if, that's the, if, if life is a un, continuously changing mm. thing, as I think most biologists or many biologists would agree, mm. then it's silly to try to define it as based on one time. For example, an eyeball. Your eyeballs, you go back, how old are eyeballs? Well, you see proto-eyeballs and proto-proto-eyeballs. So in that sense, I'm, I'm hoping that you can give us an idea about how you deconstruct life as you look further and further back in the history of life on Earth. 
Well, nobody argues whether or not bacteria are alive. Um, they meet all the criteria. Um, so I don't deconstruct beyond that, really, um, because we know so little, almost nothing, but the steps that led to the first cells, or the first population of cells. But the stromatolites that you showed us, yes. bacterial cells also had bacteriophages probably all over them. Yes. And then I could ask the question, are those bacteriophages alive? And maybe bacteriophages has something, I don't know, maybe there's a bacterial bacteriophage or something. I don't know. But the, I'm looking for those types of, of weirdnesses that sh would be a good sign that we're getting to deconstruct life and getting closer to its origin. Yeah, well... Um... You look so resigned. You're giving up. <laughs> <laughs> Like, so I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> you look so disappointed. <laughs> no, in, well, I suppose where I come at issues like that is that even proving the, the existence of um, bacterial life three and a half billion years ago is very hard. It's controversial. There are legitimate paleontologists who don't believe the fossil evidence, for example. And so that's enough of a d difficult problem for me to deal with it, to really convince people that we know about bacteria three and a half billion years ago without going further back. <laughs> you don't want to... Okay, don't want to just, <laughs> no, it's too, too please, hard. Please, <laughs> don't push me there. Please. <laughs> okay, now, a few months ago, uh, Yuri Milner gave uh, $100 million to SETI. You've heard about this. Yeah, I have heard about it. And what do you think of that? That he's given that money to SETI? That, yeah, that, what do you think of a financial shot in the arm to the SETI search? Well, I've, my attitude to SETI is that it's an interesting uh, quest, but, but I wouldn't spend my money on it. Okay, let's say that I'm going to give you a billion dollars, yes. but with the condition that you use this money to try to answer the question, are we alone? What would you do with a billion dollars? I would uh, um, put it into getting astronauts to Mars. Astronauts to Mars? Mm -hmm. uh, to Why? follow up the robotic missions, I would look for a way to drill through the eyes of Europa to look at what might be in the ocean there. And uh, I would um, probably put money to um, bigger and better space telescopes uh, that, that could look at the atmospheres of the planets uh, in other planetary systems. There's a philosopher at Oxford called Nick Bostrom who said that if we find life on Mars, it would be the terrible, terrible news because that would mean that life forms very, very easily. However, there's no sign of alien civilization, the Fermi paradox that's silent. So that means that we're going to all kill ourselves and everybody inevitably kills themselves. And, and so the bottleneck is not in the emergence of life, but the bottleneck is ahead of us and that we have looked forward to our own destruction. What do you think of that argument? Uh, well, it doesn't work in, in the case of Mars because the climate of Mars has changed so radically from early in the um, planet's history. So... Uh, the bottleneck there is a clement climate that would allow life to evolve beyond bacteria. So, so you saw uh, the, our paper, Adi Chopra, in our paper about yeah. the Gaian bottleneck. What yeah, do you I think did. of that? No, I thought it was a brilliant idea. A brilliant idea? Mm. Oh, okay, I'll take that. Did you hear that? Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, how about, now you've been involved in astrobiology for a long time. Yep. And you've seen it change, I guess, over 20 or 30 years? Where is, where is astrobiology going and where should it go? Or is it going where it should go, you think? Um, in general, it's going where it should go. I think it's been uh, dri driving um, a major aspect of planetary exploration for a long time. Uh, and it performs a, v a very useful service anyway in driving interdisciplinary thinking, which I think is a, is a fundamental uh, good for, for science. It uh, doesn't happen often enough. All right. You know, you know, you're an astronomer, you're talking to, to me, I'm a geologist. Mm -hmm. uh, didn't happen very much. Well, we're trying to figure <laughs> out whether we're alone or not. <laughs> 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 okay.
Okay, now Stephen Jay Gould has talked about replaying the tape of life, and he has said many times, and many biologists agree with him, Lauren Isley, for example, or Ernst Mayer, they think that if you replay the tape of life, you'll never get anything like what we have here, and specifically, you wouldn't get any Homo sapiens, and even more specifically, you wouldn't get human-like intelligence. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of biologists agree with that, probably 80%. On the other hand, is a biologist, Simon Conway Morris, who argues just the opposite, that the selection pressure in any environment are so convergent that you would get pretty much the same thing. Do you have a view on this controversy? No, uh, it's a very hard one. I mean, the, the question is, um, uh, oh, the, the phrase just went out of my mind. Uh, uh, the question is whether life is a cosmic imperative. That's, um, well, that's, what, that's, that's about the origin, but there's also the second question about human-like intelligence it would be a cosmic imperative. So they're two separate questions, I think. Well, they are two separate questions, okay. Um, yeah, I think um, evolution is contingent. I think the weight of evidence is, is that way. You know, the, but, but you're looking for stromatolite evidence on Mars. Now, if Mars had an independent origin of life, why would you look for stromatolite evidence? Because if it's contingent, you should not expect to see stromatolite. Or should you? Well, um, we, have to, um, we have to work from what we know, don't we? I mean, science uh, as a whole is a very conservative business. So um, we don't know a lot about life on Earth. And that, that, that's our model for looking for life elsewhere. I think that, that's the way I would answer that question. Okay, one, one argument is that, you know, if we have life evolved for billions of years, well, it goes in quirky directions. But maybe it is the case that all life starts out in similar ways, out of the chemistry and, phys and physics, that because we know that that's common, mm. but then it, it kind of, it's like a story that starts in the same way and then it diverges in different ways on different planets. Uh, do you, you think that's legitimate, a good idea? You think that makes sense? That, that life would diverge in different ways. No, that it starts out very, very similar, yeah, yeah, and do. therefore it diverges, and then if we're trying to compare our life now, four billion years later, to mm -hmm. another eight billion year old life, it's going to be, wow, is, you know, unrecognizable. But if we both traced, you know, eight billion years over here, four billion years, we traced our origins, maybe an RNA world would be at the origin of both of these. Is that, what do you yeah. think of that? Oh, I think that that's a good idea. I think that's probably the way it, way it would have been if there is indeed life elsewhere. Okay, so maybe we should be looking for RNA worlds then. Yeah. Okay. Um, so do you think human-like intelligence would re-evolve if we replayed the tape of life, let's say from, I don't know, the Cambrian, 540 million years ago or so? No, not necessarily. Not necessarily. How about if we replayed it a billion times, would it, would it ever do, would you ever create a big thing with a big brain that, that makes cameras and telescopes and rocket ships? Well, a trillion, a, a, quad, a quadrillion, <laughs> 10 to the 22. How many, what's the number that you think we need to replay in order to get something that would produce a rocket ship and a radio telescope? Yeah, well, we're not the only big brain creatures on Earth, are we? But we are the only ones who've made radio telescopes and rocket ships and asking this question. That, um, yeah, in the last hundred years or so. Um, yeah. So give the whales another 10 million years. Ten mi so you think that in 10 million years, whales will start building radio telescopes? Quite possibly. <laughs> okay. Now, I bet that pro po quite, prob quite possibly is less than 1%. <laughs> Now, 10 million years. Well, th that's, that's not a trivial question because it may be that we'll kill ourselves. It may be that some cosmic yes. catastrophe wipes us out, either bioterrorism or viruses, or maybe the, maybe the cameras will take over, the c computers will take over. So, so, uh, so what? So we need to we try to answer this question. I, actually, I call this the planet of the apes fallacy, and that is that, okay, we kill ourselves, then the other things that are most like us inhabit this intelligence niche. What do you think of that idea? I, well, I think it's quite reasonable. I you mean, do? Why? Well, evolution takes um, um, advantage of opportunities. And if we um, provide a new set of opportunities by wiping ourselves out, mm -hmm. it's very likely that um, um, something will evolve, uh, not into human life, but into some form of in intelligent life. So if you think 
if the chimpanzees go extinct, do you think we will evolve into chimpanzees? Did you say that the right way around? Maybe? Yes, I did. I said it the right way around. You're, you're saying that if one species goes extinct, another species will evolve to inhabit the niche of the previous species. Well, I'm just turning it around saying, okay, chimpanzees go extinct. We will then evolve into chimpanzees? Uh, no, we've, we've, we've already um, uh, evolved in a, to such a way as um, we're taking a bit of advantage of our environment and the chimpanzees are. So um, to evolve into chimpanzees would be to go backwards. No, we no. The chimpanzees are living today. They're they are alive today. To, we didn't uh, evolve from chimpanzees. We evolved from the common ancestors of us yeah, and chimpanzees. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we wouldn't be going backwards. We'd be going, but they would be going backwards too if chimpanzees evolved into us because they would be evolving into the common ancestor of us and chimpanzees. I meant going backwards in terms of exploiting the environment. Exploiting the environment. Mm -hmm. Making intelligent use of all the opportunities. So destroying the environment. Yeah. So you think that chimpanzees will evolve into destroying the environment as well as we're doing it now? Yes. But we would not go back into de to destroying the environment to the extent that they do. Right. So the, the, pers the, the species who destroys the environment the most is a cosmological convergent factor. Yes. <laughs> wow. Wow, Malcolm. That's such a pessimistic vision of where evolution is going. Um, why is it pessimistic? Well, exploitation of your environment sounds so unsustainable. I'll give you an example. One, the, I think it was Arthur C. Clarke who said, any sufficiently advanced technology will be indistinguishable from magic. Then there's a guy called uh, Carl somebody, Carl Sp Sch Schroeder, who says, any sufficiently advanced technology will be indistinguishable from nature. Not magic, but nature. In other words, if we get really technologically sophisticated, we become more tree-hugging, sustainable, and we don't exploit, but rather we preserve and maintain and sustain. And so that seems to be opposed to what you just proposed as the direction of evolution of chimpanzees, of what, they will happen, what will happen if we go extinct. Yeah, well, exploit might, might not be the best word, but um, make make best use of um, the environment. Um, so you think we are making better use of the environment than the chimpanzees are right now yes. on this planet? Yes. Even though we're destroying it. <laughs> you're, back, you're backing me into a corner. Well, well that's right. I'm trying, that's my job as an interviewer. Right? <laughs> Just some water, so let's have some water. <laughs> I think gin will be better. <laughs> um, well, what I think is, we, we may, despite all, all the difficulties, we're making uh, a more intelligent use of our opportunities than other chimpanzees. If we kill ourselves, and you would still argue that? Yes. Would have so, been a lot of fun along the way. Well, I had an uncle who was in, known in the family for being the smartest one. He couldn't sharpen a pencil because he had such a strong edible complex, and he just didn't have any get married, so he didn't have any children. And so this was kind of that's smart. I mean, if you're gonna, I thought if you're gonna value your brain is there to help you survive. Yes. And I would have thought that that's the Darwinian test of intelligence, and there is not an, one independent of that. Would you agree with that? It's not a test independent of that, of the Darwinian... Of intelligence. I mean, we've used the word intelligence yeah. as if it's independent of, you know, hey, I can multiply 10-digit numbers together in three mm -hmm. seconds. And um, it just seems to me that if, if we, when we study evolution, the only test of intelligence or the test of the, the viability of any organ is whether it keeps the owner of that organ alive. And if this organ that we have, a big brain, kills us, I would have thought that that's really, really stupid. Yeah, if it does kill us. And it but, might. And it, it, it might, but we, we have the intelligence and the wit to avoid that. You think? I do. Oh, well, that's something optimistic. Tell us about that. How is that going to work? We're here now. Yes. We've survived um, for 250,000 years, yeah. perhaps. We now, have, we now have big atomic weapons. 
we now have bioterrorism. Which, we have people going around killing themselves. Yes. And uh, we might machines might take over and beat us, you know, beat us up like in the Matrix. <laughs> Terminator, blah, 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 kill all the humans, kill yeah, the humans. Yeah. So you don't think those are viable scenarios? I mean, oh, they're all possible scenarios, but but we're managing them. You know, I'm well, the, not... if you're a chimpanzee, you wouldn't have to manage them. You would have, you wouldn't produce these crazy things that are so self-destructive. Oh, but you could be wiped out by a disease that, that um, creatures such as ourselves could defeat. I see. Okay. All right. Now, what about nano aliens? I've, I've proposed that we should be looking for nano aliens with electron microscopes or scanning tunneling microscopes in the, in the, with the idea that, you know, these events, we're making technology smaller and smaller and smaller. Mm -hmm. And I guess if you extrapolate a, a million years into the future, then you can make it really tiny and then you could have nano aliens going all over the place and they'd be so small that no one has seen them. What do you think of that idea? Is that crazy? No, it's not crazy, uh, but we have the ability to look for nano aliens and we do, but no one seems to be following up. I can't convince a microscopist to start looking for nano aliens. They think I'm crazy. Well, you know, we had our fingers burnt with nanobacteria not so long ago. Yes. So tell me about that story. What happened to Filippo Owens? <laughs> <laughs> not on camera. <laughs> okay. All right. So, all right. So tell me about, in general, then, nanobacteria, that was some scientists reported they had seen it. And what happened? They go away and it, they mistook... Something else for nanobacteria? Or? Yeah, um, it was a fashion from about um, 10 years at the most. And there was a lot of debate about uh, how small life could get. Yes. It relates to your question about nanoorganisms, nano life. And uh, any conceivable form of life that has biochemical machinery or needs proteins um, doesn't get. That's smaller than about a tenth of a micron. How small can viruses get? <laughs> small, I don't know. I can't remember how, exactly how big they are. Well, um, how many oligopeptides? We have three base pairs. Was that a life form? Yeah, well... Ten? Yeah. Two? One? <laughs> um, yeah, they're, they're, they're smaller than, than bacteria. It's quite true. Um, it's, we're back to the question of whether such things as viruses uh, are alive or not, yes. or whether they can any way. Well, you, you wanted to well, make a, a minimum. You wanted to. You started out talking about a minimum size for life. Yes. And then you also said viruses are life, and then you started talking about the stuff that viruses don't have, and so I was got confused. Yeah. Well, we're back in that grey area of, of what what is life. Isn't, isn't that it? where we should be? No, I don't think it's particularly useful. Um, I thought it's the most useful thing. We disagree on this completely then. Yeah. I would have thought that, that grey area is where we should be because that's where we know life had to come from. And you're saying, no, it's not useful. It, it's defining what life is that, that um, trips us up all the, all the time, mm -hmm. I think. And it doesn't lead anywhere uh, productive. I mean, you can, you can uh, hypothesise that... Uh, there was um, a, a time when there were only virus-like things, and that, that went on to form cells. Uh, can hypothesize, but also that, but went on to form themselves because they're still with us, right? Yes. So they didn't just go that way and then stop. They they're here today, everywhere in your body, all over you. Yeah, but they don't live independently. Neither do you. You're not independent living, right? If you couldn't reproduce, as one individual, you can't reproduce. Even two individuals, you put them in a spaceship in outer space, they will die, they'll not reproduce. Yes. So, so I'm on a one-man crusade to get rid of this self-reproduction as a criterion for life because it makes zero sense to me. Right. You know, what I'm, you know where I'm yeah, coming from. Yeah, I know. No, so can you me. push back on that? <laughs> no, 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 I can't really. Um, I, I just don't find it useful to um, try and push the definition of life. I'm not trying to push it, I'm trying to get rid of it. Because the, the mm. people who talk about self-reproduction, I said, mm. get rid of that. I prefer to live in a gray area. Mm. Well, I'd like to live in a gray area as well. Okay, so. 50 shades of gray. <laughs> okay, <laughs> very good. All right, how about, uh, could we be, in the, you've seen the movie Men in Black? No. I no, you haven't seen it? Anyway, at the end of that movie, they have a, a galaxy that's in a pendant hanging around a cat, 
And the idea <laughs> is that we, our galaxy is in a giant cat, I guess. In other yeah, words, right. in some sense, we are inside of an alien. And that always appealed to me for it's a crazy idea. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, you can imagine that you have about 10 trillion cells in your brain. Mm -hmm. And probably each one of those cells doesn't know that it's in your brain, right? No. Uh -huh. And so is there any sense in which that could be our situation where there are lots and lots of life forms here and they're all some part of some bigger thing that we're unaware of? <laughs> I can't imagine being unaware of it. We have so many ways of, of um, examining our environment, examining the planets, examining the universe. Uh, that I can't imagine some sort of entity there that, that could, uh, could remain hidden. Okay. How about, uh, you know, we recently discovered gravitational waves. Do you mm. think uh, the SETI searches should switch over to trying to do a gravitational wave SETI searches? <laughs> That's been beyond my pay grade. <laughs> okay. <laughs> how, about, how about neutrinos? Well, how about, how about you know, we do radio. And what do you think of optical? What do you think of X-ray SETI, et cetera? In the entire electromagnetic spectrum? Or throw that out and maybe it's neutrinos. Or throw that out and maybe it's gravitational waves. There's a whole bunch of options here. I mean, do you have any vision about, or any idea about one over the other? Um, no, not really, because I don't have that, that sort of expertise. But um, um, in the sense that, that SETI is worth doing at all, uh, it should encompass all the possibilities. Okay. How about, uh, you know, this eerie silence that we're, we haven't seen any aliens. Mm. And, you know, Fermi's paradox mm. says, you know, hey, if the galaxy is 10 billion years old, the earliest life forms, if they evolve into intelligent life forms, then they colonize the galaxy. They could have done so many times over. If that's the case, then where are they? That's Fermi's paradox. So what is your favorite solution to that paradox? Where uh, are they? Reading one of your papers about the <laughs> <laughs> and the relative timing of um, the d development of other galaxies and planetary systems. So, as a stromatolite expert, you have nothing to contribute to that debate about trying to answer this cosmic silence issue. For example, maybe life forms evolve into stromatolites, and that's what they're happy doing, and they have different types of stromatolites, and boom, and everywhere in the universe there are stromatolites, but there aren't this type of intelligence that builds with radio telescopes. Is that something that you'd be okay with? No, I wouldn't be okay with that, because uh, I think if there's um, sufficient time for evolution to occur anywhere, um, then that opens up the possib possibility of um, more complex organisms forming. I think if there is life out there, there are going to be complex organisms out there as well. That build radio telescopes? Yeah. So you give a whale 10 million years. How about a chimpanzee? How long will it take a chimp to build a radio telescope? Uh, less than 10 million? Uh, less, than, less than it would take a whale, yes. Because whales don't even have hands, right? I mean, have, okay. All right. So, so this intelligence niche idea, which you seem to subscribe to, mm -hmm. Let's leave Australia. Let's let's pretend that Homo sapiens did not evolve in Africa and then spread out to the rest of the world. Let's just say they spread. They stayed in Africa, and Australia is here and mm -hmm. is drifting all by itself. Kangaroos are evolving. Mm -hmm. You know, all life forms on Australia are evolving. And let's suppose that we're doing an experiment. We're going to keep Australia separate. And how long would it take before I don't know kangaroos or koalas or something produced a radio telescope? <laughs> Because um, that's what you're subscribing to. You say, yeah, if, I, if you give it long enough, it'll do that. Yeah, so yeah. I kind of disagree with that, so I'm trying to push you here. <coughs> uh, maybe a few tens of millions of years. A few tens of millions of years. Mm. And that comes out of where? Where'd you get that number? Well, we had to know quite a lot about pace of evolution, particularly uh, in the mammals, for example. Um, and we know what's happened over the last few tens of millions of years. Mm -hmm. We're... Uh, substantial accuracy. Um, so if we predict forward a few tens of millions of years, mm -hmm. um, just about anything's possible. Okay, so how long would it take us to evolve into chimpanzees? They go extinct. How long would it take humans to evolve into chimpanzees? I don't think we, we would evolve into chimpanzees. So why would you think kangaroos would evolve into people? Um, 
Because there were no people to um, compete with. So you think there's a people niche, a human-like niche that is universal that other species are trying to evolve into? Not no, not necessarily human-like, but um, evolution is happening all around us now. It doesn't stop just because we're here. Um, but if you extract us from, from the new ecosystem, then that op opens up possibilities for other organisms to take advantage of the sorts of things that we've taken advantage of. But that's, you could say the same thing about any species, can't you? Yeah. So if I take away the chimps, how long will it take us to evolve into chimps then? Uh, there's no advantage in involving in, into a, a chimp. So I mean, you think there is an advantage of chimp evolving into us then? Yes. What is that advantage in your view? Well, if, if there were no humans on Earth, uh, then uh, there are the opportunities that we already take. Um, building cities, doing the things that we do. Like so they're, 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 open, they're open niches right. in an evolutionary sense. And, uh, but that's the same if you kill any species. You kill dragonflies. How long would it take us to evolve into dragonflies? Um, or any species evolve into dragonflies? Not necessarily into dragonflies, but to evolve into something that can take advantage of its environment in a comparable way um, the way we take advantage of our environment. It doesn't mean we evolve into chimps or that uh, we take away the dragonflies, something else evolve into dragonflies, but it, um, into some sort of organism that exploits the same niche. So by exploiting the same niche, you think it's like an intelligence niche? So producing a radio telescope and cars and computers, this is a niche which is exploitable and would be exploitable by other species if we were not here. Is that right? Yes. What's the evidence for that? Uh, just um, uh, a, a view of evolution, that um, if there's an opportunity, something evolves to grasp that opportunity. That's what evolution demonstrates to us, in my view. Okay, so uh, how... All right, let's move on to another question. Uh, what kind of... Now, let's, let's try to turn off your science mind, and I'm going to ask you your emotional mind. So if you close your eyes for a second here, I'm just going to ask you about your emotions. What kind of aliens would you like to find emotionally? <laughs> Ones I could communicate with. Communicate with. Mm. And so they'd communicate with you, and then they'd kill you, because you'd have nothing to offer them. That they'd say, "Oh, I want to communicate with you," and you tell them your name and stromatolite information, and then they just destroy you. You can communicate with those, but that's not the. Would you like the, that to happen? Be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 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 Now, do you want to learn their language, or do you want them to learn learn your language? If, you could, if you're going to communicate, presumably it's a language. Mm. And so I'm talking, well, who, who's, whose language are you going to be using here? Oh, I think that's a mutual thing, isn't it? Well, it's go to the UN and, and everybody's learning English because that's becoming the international language. But, uh, you know, the, uh, if the French learned English and the English learned French, then, you know, they've gone too far. All you have to do is the French learn English and then everybody speak English, or the English learn French and then everybody speak French. So you don't need to do it both ways. Even in the United Nations, they have um, simultaneous translations and you see p people with headphones on. So. so that's how you'd like to have it. You'd have headphones that translate whatever the aliens are saying. Well, that would be one way to go. Okay, so this communication, why do you want to communicate? What, what would it, what's, it, what's in it for you? I'm curious about the universe. What, go ahead. What are the questions? I'm an alien. Hello, I'm an alien. <laughs> Ask me some questions. <laughs> um... Can you travel faster than the speed of light? No, I cannot. Go ahead, ask me another question. Have you discovered other aliens in other parts of the universe? Yes, but we killed them. <laughs> um, I think you should let, let us live because we can teach you a lot of interesting things. Like what? Like how not to um, destroy your environment. We have already figured that out. We have lived four <laughs> billion years longer than you have. How can you teach us something? Well, we have a different perspective on, on lots of things, no doubt. It, you are like an amoeba to us. <laughs>
Well, if we're no use to you, just leave us alone and go somewhere else. We're going to destroy you just like we destroy all life. Oh, well, there's no point to this conversation then, is there? So this was not interesting communication between us. It started off as interesting communication, <laughs> but very, quick, very quickly deteriorated. Well, well, I'm just trying to understand. You said that you wanted to communicate with aliens, and yeah. I'm trying to understand the details of, I mean, besides having a romantic, uh, high-in-the-sky vision of, yeah, it'd be cool to talk to aliens, I mean, what are the specifics of it? For example, some physicists want them to answer all the physics questions and say the theory of everything, yeah. and other more... Uh, socio humanists want to hey solve all of our problems and our ethical issues and that's another thing that they want aliens to do um, and so I'm wondering as a as an earth scientist what kind of do you have any questions that the scientific questions that you want the aliens to to solve or yeah well I'd certainly like to know how life started on this planet or everywhere 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 so mm. so you'd like to know is how... it inevitable okay is life a cosmic imperative and why is that important why what because Some people don't, I mean, like most of the people on this planet, we've got like 8 billion people, hardly anybody, maybe less than 1% care about this issue, and then there's another 10% who think it's a cool question, but they really would rather watch TV. So, but you're not, you're one of these 1%, so what, what is it about your worldview that makes this an important question? I'm just curious about, uh, about the world, about the universe, and uh, how life started is probably the biggest question of all. For me, and uh, I'd, I'd like to know the answer. Is it a bigger question for you because you're like an atheist rather than a Christian? If you're a Christian, oh, God started and they're finished. I don't need to think about it anymore. Yeah. But because you're not a Christian, that makes this question bigger and more important for you? Uh, th yes, I think so. Okay. Um, now, this, this uh, interview is part of a MOOC course, a massive open online course for students. And you've talked to a lot of students in astrobiology. And what are some of the biggest misconceptions among students that you've run into? I've been shocked a few times. Um, um, that I've um, had students, undergraduate students, who haven't known the difference between a planetary system and, and a galaxy, for example. I've come across that several times. Um, I've had creationist students who even got, got as far as um, a third-year science course. So what did, what did, do you wouldn't believe in evolution. Well, what did you do with these third years? Do you poo-poo them, or do you, you make them feel bad about their religious beliefs, or how do you deal with that? I, I, I know I, I don't deal with people who um, are creationists in, in that sense. There's no point, as far as I'm concerned. I'm not a Richard Dawkins. I don't argue with everybody. Uh, just the pointless exercise. How about this idea? E.O. Wilson at, at Harvard has talked about this debate between science and religion. And he has said that every time science and religion conflict, then science wins because we have evidence on their side and religion is just a bunch of mythology. On the other hand, as a biologist, you know that your brain has evolved to find useful things, adaptations that will keep you alive, independent of whether those things are true or not. And in that sense, your, your, your brain is there for finding any ideas as long as they're useful. But he, Wilson says, no, no, our brain doing science finds the truth. And so then he complains, of, but I would have thought that as an evolutionary biologist, you would say, hey, my brain, your brain, human brains are there to have useful ideas. This religion thing may probably a useful thing, then therefore you shouldn't complain about it because you pretend that you have a truth which was discovered with an organ that's meant to find useful things independent of whether it's true or not. Do you, you see what I'm going? Yeah, I think that, that, that's a difficult issue, isn't it? Um, my answer is that um, there's no evidence that religion is useful. Is that right? Mm. There are a couple of articles that have been published, matter of fact, two weeks ago in Nature saying that how these big gods help you know, the God look overlooking your shoulder help people be so, pro-social with strangers. You, you might have run across that. No, I, I haven't. So there, there are a bunch of anthropologists trying to just trying to figure out, okay, might there be some adaptive value to uh, religion? And you say probably not. No, I'd say probably, almost certainly not. I think the evidence is not. So how did it evolve? It's just a crazy idea that why, I mean, 
Here's the, here's the, here's my counter argument. If you go, if you discover a hunting, go back ten thousand years, mm. or go to the most remote hunter gatherers today in the world, mm. you will inevitably find that they have some type of religion which we classify as animist or yes. sometimes superstition. Yes. Now, to me, that means that to be a human is to be an animist. So I don't call myself an atheist. I call myself an animistic atheist because of that. Now, that means that I have this brain here that sees how the spirits everywhere and it's making up all kinds of stuff and that sometimes I believe it, but then I turn on my rational brain and say, get out of here, I'm an atheist. Mm. So I, I feel like I have that inside of me and that means, but I think that means that animism is an, are a series of ideas that must have been useful to our ancestors, otherwise it wouldn't be universal in humans as it appears to be. Yeah, well... I think we, we need stories. We need to try and explain what we see around us. Uh, and that's the source of animism and religion. But uh, there's less and less room for stories without evidence as science evolves. So uh, science is replacing that, that sort of thinking, in my view. But that means that stories were useful before we had science. Yes. So religion had a use, but its use is being undermined by science. Yes. That's my view. Okay. All right. Now, how about, uh, do you have any advice for students about how to think about the question, are we alone? <clears throat> I, I can, the fundamental advice there would be to keep an open mind and to... Um, try to practice interdisciplinary science. Think of the big picture, learn enough about um, branches of science outside your direct expertise, enough at least to have conversations. Okay, and how about, did you meet Lynn Margulis? Yeah, many times. Could you tell us about some Lynn Margulis stories? <laughs> Better not. No. <laughs> For example, I went to meet her. I, I, met, I spent a day with her, and I remember she, we were walking her dog by getting in her car and driving around the neighborhood, and the dog just followed him <laughs> and all of her. And I was very impressed by that. And then we went in the morning. We went swimming in this little dirty fungal pond to see some gigantic organism that I had never. I can't even remember the name of it. But uh, anyway, it was a lovely day. She really knew how to grab onto life in a way that few scientists still do. Mm. And uh, so. Do you have anything that happened to you like that? Or? No, Lynn's a very uh, creative thinker, and uh, she always impressed me. Um, you, Carl Sagan's first wife, uh, I think, perhaps. You know, I've, I've been at dinner parties with her, and that, there's always good conversation, mm -hmm. and a good, interesting conversation. So she's a very sim stimulating thinker. Um, she was one of the first people who championed the idea of uh, the sort of evolution I talked about before, where, where different sorts of cells came together, symbiotic, the, the symbiotic model of, of evolution. She championed that um, right back in the 1960s. So she was a pioneer there. But she's also kind of a supporter of something called autopoiesis. And almost everything she does, I think, is great, except for this idea of autopoiesis based on Maturana, a uh, Chilean, Spanish-speaking philosopher of biology. And have, did you ever talk to her about that? Did you ever hear about that? No, or? I've never even heard about it. Okay, all right. And um, how about, and you already talked about Carl Sagan. So let me ask you again, we're finishing up here. Uh, are we alone? I doubt it. I, I really doubt it, but um, I, I have no evidence. And why do you doubt it? Because um, planetary systems are so common. As far as we can push the evidence of evolution on Earth, it was a natural outcome of physical and chemical processes. Um, um, even though we can't quantify the steps in the origin of life, We're getting close to being able to say that it was a natural process. And if, if that's correct, then there's going to be life all over the universe. And why should anybody care about this? Why should our students care about the answer to this question? 
anybody with natural curiosity would want to know whether there's life out there, um, whether we're alone in the universe. It just seems to me you know, something that, that um, any inquisitive person would want answered. So the, the non-contextualized life is not worth living? <laughs> the non-contextualized life. You know, the, oh, you well. know the statement, the non-examined life is not worth living. And so here we are, we're contextualizing by putting us how we fit into the universe. Well, it's worth living, but, but, but it, it's such a great quest, um, uh, such a great question that, that it, it, um, uh, it ener energizes us in, in thinking about this. We're inquisitive creatures. We're explorers. Now, I've asked the question, of, are we alone to Martin Rees, the Astronomer Royale? And he, yeah. he and many astrophysicists share the idea that, well, we're evolving into computers, so... Forget looking for life on planets, we should be looking for computerized life, which would be spaceships essentially anywhere, not located on the surface of any planet. Mm. What do you think of that idea? Uh, but like I said before, we, we should keep an open mind when we're first searching for life. Um, maybe there's silicon based life, same sort of question as uh, looking for spaceships. So, uh, I think it's a reasonable idea. Maybe you know, he's right, but that's not the only way to search for life elsewhere. So you'd look for primitive life, more like stromatolites, because that's what you've studied your whole life. Uh, no, I, I'd look for primitive life because that's the sort of life that's likely to be most common. Uh, it's least demanding of its environment, and, uh, and so you say the least demanding. Yes. What does that mean? I, I... Um, it's hard to kill. Um, and uh, um, it's likely to, if it, if, hmm, I'm getting tongue tied now. If, if um, life did evolve anywhere else, then it would have started from something simple uh, and. Um, the, that sort of life um, is likely to be the most, most common form of life anywhere in the universe. But, let me back up there, if, if let's say that the average age of planets, um, Earth-like planets, is 8 billion years old, and we're only half that old, that means for if we can stay alive, then for 4 billion years, our life will be computer and spacecraft and technology, silicon-based life, not carbon-based life. And so if that's the case, then most of, and if other life does that elsewhere, then most life in the universe will not be the simple organic-based life, but rather, I guess, machine-based life. Maybe. Yeah. But that doesn't rule out the possibility that, that um, there'd be organic life as well. <laughs>